In this segment, we're going to take a look at using Rotate and Mirror. So to get started, what I'm going to do is choose to create an outline shape and just simply draw some sort of an irregular shape. It really doesn't matter, just so that we can see how we can create um, a new object and then use mirror imaging. So here's my object here. And basically, now that I've right-clicked, um, it's selected on my screen. Now. Um, the easiest way to mirror image anything is going to be in the tool options. And so I'll open up my tool options. And because I want to use my tool options a bit right now, I'm just going to use the push pin to stick the tool options um, roll up open so that it's there for us to see. Now, if I click, here's the two options for mirror X and mirror Y. If I choose mirror X, you'll see what it does. It flips the object um, back and forth, I guess, horizontally. And the opposite could be true if I do mirror Y. It'll flip my object back and forth vertically. So let's say you select an object and then you use duplicate to create a new copy. And then you use the mirror X to make that copy be mirror imaged. And then you just place the two objects um, across from each other. And you can see where I've created a mirror image of these two objects. And I could do the same thing. Maybe I'll um, click and drag a box around both of those objects to select them both duplicate and then mirror Y and bring those two objects down so that basically we're creating um, copies of the same object and just using the different you know concept of mirror X and Y so that's generally how it works and you can use it to make things um, sort of equal halves of each other so if you're doing a design of a butterfly and you want to design half the butterfly and then use um, duplicate or copy and paste to to create the objects for the second half of the butterfly and then just quickly um, mirror image them to flip them over and place them in place. Um, another thing you can do is rotate an image or a, an object and I guess there's really two options for rotating. The first one is going to be, and we've looked at this already, is the handles that show up here on the side of the object where we can choose to rotate it. But we also have um, a rotation option in the tool options box. And so in here, here's my option or my object that I've selected. And I could come in here and choose to rotate it by any specific angle. So if I type in 75 degrees, it'll rotate it 75 degrees. If I want to rotate it 90 degrees, type in 90. So it's going to always rotate by the specific degree that you choose. And if you want to put it back, you don't like it, you always have the undo button to put it back to the original. So yeah, that's a little bit about using mirror image for along the x-axis or the y-axis and the rotation button within the object properties. In this segment, we're going to talk about a specialized feature called convert object to outline. And what I'm going to do is simply start by just creating an embroidery ellipse and then right click to finish and the object is selected. Now if we take a look, this is one object and it's an object that has a red fill and a blue outline. But it's still all one object and if I select on that object and then right click it brings up the secondary menu where we have other options. And one of the options here is convert outline to object. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that now. Now, it looks more or less the same, but what we can see now is my fill and my outline have been separated from each other. So that's one thing that happened was it basically broke apart that object and made it into two. And one other thing that happened is that the outline um, has been converted to have two sides, which can therefore be edited. Um, what I'll do is I'll just draw a line and show it so you can see the difference. So if I draw a line using the line tool and right click, there's my line. But notice if I wanted to edit the shape of this line, it's I drew the center of this line and that's how I can modify the shape. So it's a steel stitch. It's an equal satin stitch column that goes back and forth around a center line. Now if I was to select this object right here, even though it has no fill, I can still right click and say convert outline to object. And what you'll notice now is 
instead of being the instead of having the pink wireframe down the center it's created the pink wireframe around the edges of that object and so the benefit here is now if I choose to um, edit the shape nodes instead of just having one shape node I have two and therefore I could create one area of my design to be slightly thicker than another area of the design and so that's the real difference between um, if I create an, I'll just make a new object so I have something to show the difference. Um, if I just create a line like this, in this object I just have a center line which if I wanted to modify my object I can simply move that line to create a new line but the line is staying an equal shape whereas this one that I had converted to be an outline object has two sides and therefore the shape nodes on both sides of that could be modified to have a, I guess, a thick and thin style of shape. So that's the um, tool that's known as Convert Object to Outline. In this segment, we're going to take a look at the Convert to Curves option. And I showed this a little bit already when I was talking about text. And I'll just show what I've shown so far again. So we'll type in a name, type in my name, and then I'm going to select that object my select tool. Now if I chose edit shape nodes right now you'll notice that all I get is the little handles where I can move my lettering around but I can't actually reshape the letters there's no nodes on them and that's where again if I select the object and then right click for my secondary menu I have the option called convert to curves so I'll go ahead and choose that and you can see right away when I choose convert to curves that the um, letters already have little sort of nodes added to them and if I go now to choose edit shape nodes I actually have all the nodes for these letters and if you want to you can change the shapes of your letters so that's convert to curves as it relates to um, a lettering object what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna delete um, the lettering object and I'm gonna go ahead and just create a simple shape using my shaping tool and of course I'm now adding in nodes as I design them so there's my nodes there's the shape that I created and I could easily go to edit shapes and or edit nodes and change my shape but what happens when you work with a, a stitch file like a Genomi Jeff file for example I'm gonna take this simple shape and choose file and save as and here's my folder called Trevor's Designs and we'll just call this I guess shapes now I don't want to save it as a draw file I want to save it as a Jeff file so this is just like mm, the design that you're gonna have purchased or your friend has sent to you or you've downloaded from the internet whatever I've saved it as a Jeff file for the Genomi format and it says it's done that's great so okay what I can do now is choose Let's say you, had a, you wanted to start a new design and you were basing your new design on some embroidery. So I'll choose from embroidery and I'm going to browse up to the folder that said Trevor's Designs and we'll go into there. Now we, in here I have a few Jeff files that I've created and one of them is the one that we just created called shapes.jeff. So we're going to choose that and then I go forward with my um, artwork source dialog box and I have to choose the fabric that sounds good it shows me the colors in case I want to reduce them and I just choose finish so here's the design and very similar to the draw file that we had created obviously it looks exactly the same this is the Jeff file but what's different now is if I just click on the object to select it and I can show you I can move the outline and the fill are two separate objects which is great um, but what I can't do if I choose on one of these and choose edit shape nodes I don't have any ability to edit the shapes of these objects they're they're brought in as embroidery um, an embroidery design is brought in but it's not brought in and automatically converted into I guess a vector which is then easily edited so this is where you have the ability if you select an object and right click on it you can choose to convert to curves and it goes ahead and it actually adds shape nodes around your object and it adds perhaps more nodes than um, you would have added but it needs to add enough nodes to be able to follow the, your shape now now that I've done that if I choose the edit shape nodes you'll see that I have shape nodes and I could 
reshape this object. So if you bring in an embroidery design and you want to have the ability to somehow change the shape or modify the stitches um, like you created them, then that's where we have this option to create um, the choose the tool, convert to curves. So it's fun. And I'll do it one more time. So this again, if I choose edit objects or edit nodes, I have no ability to edit the shape of this object. But if I select that object, right click, choose convert to curves, it gives me all those shape nodes that I need. And now if I choose edit shape nodes, I can easily modify the shape of that satin column. So that's convert to curves as it relates to text and as it relates to existing embroidery designs. In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the options for group, ungroup, and combine and break apart. Now, perhaps what I'll do to show that is, I guess first of all, I'll just create myself one, two, three, four um, objects and show that if I was to drag a box to select all four objects and then right click over top of them, I have the option of either group or combine. Now, group will put all four objects become selectable as one thing. And same thing, if I resize them, they resize as a group. So they become a group of objects, but the way they stitch is still four individual objects. So it'll, so this fill and this outline, and this fill and this outline, this fill and this outline, and this fill and this outline. Now, I can also right click and choose ungroup. And when I ungroup, then again, we're back to just individually selectable objects. Now, that's different than using combine. And I can use combine on these same four objects. And what I do, when I do, if I use combine as opposed to group, I'll use combine. What it does is it actually connects them in terms of sewing order. So what it's going to do is it's going to do the red of this one, the red of this one. It looks like it comes over, does the red of this one, back over here, and then down here. It tries to connect them all together. And then it'll sew the outlines all at the same time. And the opposite of um, combining is breaking apart. Now, maybe this isn't the most natural place to use the combine. So what if I had drawn a shape? All right, so I'll just draw myself a bit of an outline tool. There's a piece of fill. And now before I break uh, the object, I'm going to draw some more embroidery. So I'll draw a line. And maybe I'll draw another line over here. And so now what I have is a fill and two lines. And now I'm going to right click. And you can see that because of the way I designed them, they're automatically combined, which means this line and this line will sew at the same time as the outline that goes around this fill. And I guess what I could do is select that. And I could choose to break it apart if I didn't want that. So the difference between group and ungroup is that when you use group, if I group these three shapes together and say group, they'll still sew as three individual shapes, but they will be selectable and editable as a group. And I can then ungroup them. But if I choose to combine them, not only are they selectable and editable as a group, they're sewn together as um, objects that belong together and sequence together. So that's the difference between using group and ungroup and combine and break apart. In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the Clipper library. And that's found here under your Tools drop-down menu. At the bottom it says Clipart Library. And there are two options available. One is Insert Clipart, and then the other option is Create Clipart. And that's gray at the moment. And we'll come back to talking about creating Clipart for the Clipart library. But first, just to get started, I'm going to choose Insert Clipart. And so the Clipart Library window comes open. And what we can see here are images of the different Clipart that's available you know, pre-installed with the software. And so I can, I guess, use this window to sort of scroll through all of those items. And you basically click on something to select it. Now, down at the bottom, it have we have something called tags. And tags are a way to make it help you refine your search for clip art. As your clip art collection grows, this will become very important. And so if I click on the little plus here, it gives me a little drop down menu and I can choose from here a list of categories that have been already created. So if I choose hearts, 
we'll see that three different designs are available because those designs have the word hearts in their tags. And notice here that this particular design has the word red and the word hearts in its tags. And just as an example, if I right click over top of any item, I can go to the tag filter option and you can see here that hearts is selected. Now, if I choose red at, from this menu, I have added the word red to the tag filter. And therefore, I only have hearts that have the word red and hearts in their tags, which is there's obviously only one. Now you can right click over top of your icons and go to your tag filter and remove one of these check boxes, or you could just say clear and it would give you all of your items again. So that's how you can find clip art from your clip art collection. And by the way, with this right click secondary menu, I also have the ability to switch to just viewing the items as icons. So that's going to show me more of them at a time and it doesn't tell me their tags or their size, but it does, if you mouse over them, it will tell you that information. Now, if I was to right click again, I could go back to the details view. And also from the right click menu, I have the ability to um, rename the icon or the design and edit the tags for that design. So that's something that you can also do. So I'm going to go ahead and select um, one of these items and say insert. Now my mouse, as you can see, has become a little cross and I have two options to use this tool. One is just to simply left click and it will place the item wherever I click on my screen at the size that it was created in as default. And the second option would be to click and drag, which would give me the ability to change the size and, and direction of the design. And I'll show both methods. So I'll just start by simply clicking now. And when I left click, it placed that heart on my screen. So that's how you would use the tool. Now, if I'm going to start again, I'll just say tools, clip art, insert clip art, select the image or the icon again, the design again, choose insert, and this time I'm going to left click and drag. And I'm holding my mouse key down and I can move the direction of the heart and the size of the heart by just clicking and dragging. Now, when I let go of my mouse right now, it finishes that um, process and sets the design down on my screen at the size and direction that I had selected. So that's how you can use the clip art tool to insert a design, insert a piece of clip art into your workspace. And now let's talk about creating clip art. And so I've got this little embroidery design here that I created and it's just simply um, a circular wreath sort of shape. And what I can do is select that and then choose tools, clip art library, create clip art. And when I choose create clip art, I need to do one more important step before it's finished and that's I need to click and drag to create a direction arrow for the direction that this design will be placed. And so when I let go, it opens up the clip art window and it inserts our new embroidery design as part of the clip art library and it wants me to name it so I'll call it wreath. And hit enter. So I've created that new piece of clip art. And one thing that our clip art doesn't have is any tags that would make it come up in any searches. And so if I right click over top, I could choose to edit the tags. And that gives me the ability to come in here and type in wreath or shapes. And then I hit enter. And so now if I go to the tags list, you'll see that wreath, if I scroll down, has actually been added to the tags list because I created a new tag with that name. And it simply shows the one design. If I was to pull up shapes, there'll be more than one because we'll see the shapes that already existed plus the one that I just created. So that's how you can create your own um, clip art for use with the clip art library. And now if I want to use this wreath, I simply select it choose insert and then I can left click and drag to insert that new object or I would just click to set it see left click and drag allowed me to make it slightly smaller 
Now there's one more way that you can create your own um, clip art. And instead of selecting the object and then instead of saying tools and create clip art, if we just choose insert clip art. And then when you have your window open, if you right click and choose add object, it more or less is the same process, although you aren't asked to give the direction arrow. And so anyway, we can go ahead and call this Trevor, Trevor Reith or something, I guess, I don't know, and insert that. And so that's the two different ways that you can create clip art, and then you can use the tags to select the clip art. So that's my section about using the clip art library and how you can add and create your own motifs in the clip art library. In this segment, I'll show you how to use the insert symbol tool and that's found under the tools drop down menu here where it says insert symbol. So I go ahead and click that and this window appears and I guess the first thing you get to choose from is the font that includes the symbol. So clicking on that drop down menu shows me, you know, a bunch of different fonts and um, sets that include little symbols like this. For example, the military ID has all sorts of little military symbols, but if I go to the webdings or the windings fonts, then they have little just little things that might be um, helpful or interesting in some type of an embroidery design. And so you go ahead and choose the different options and then you find the little symbol that you want to work with. And so basically I'll just create one of these little shapes and so I choose that and I say insert. Now my mouse becomes a cross and it needs me to click and drag to set the size and the angle of the um, symbol that I'm inserting into my design. So you choose those visually and when I'm done it actually comes back up with the insert symbol toolbox still open and now if I don't if I want to create more symbols, I can go ahead and create more symbols. Or if I'm done, I can simply um, close the box. So that's how you use the tool. And basically, once you've inserted the symbol, it's just like any other object. You can choose the um, fill or the outline. So I can turn the outline off and change it from satin stitch to step stitch or whatever kind of stitch you want. And so they become objects. But the tool is called Tools insert symbol and you can choose a symbol and insert that into your embroidery design. Now it's time to learn about the object properties and so what I need to do is just to start off I'm going to come to my desktop and I'm just going to choose the freehand shape tool and I'll just try and draw some sort of a embroidery object it really doesn't matter what it is but I'm going to make sure that I have a a closed shape so that we can see that with a closed shape we have a piece of red fill and it has blue outline and I can also confirm that just by selecting the shape and then looking at the bottom to see that I have red fill selected and blue outline selected so the object properties is this box that's over here on the right hand side and you can see that it has tabs and one tab is for the fill and the other tab is for the outline and so this is how we're going to be able to control the type of stitching that are in our embroidery objects and so yeah I'll build upon this perhaps in this first segment I'll just review the general things that we're going to learn about and then I'll come back with a series of segments to explain in more detail each of those topics so Basically, this is the fill tab, and you can see here that we could choose the type of stitch from the first option box here. And right now, it's just set for auto, which means the, the software has automatically chosen for us the type of fill stitch. Now, if you want to override it, you can change it between you know step or satin just by clicking on the different options. And we'll come back and review those more in a minute, but we also have the ability to choose from styles, and patterns. We'll talk about removing the overlaps when you have multiple objects that are touching or overlapping each other. And we have a, the ability to override the sequence control and, and sort of change that ourselves. 
and then this tells us about the density, the compensation, and the underlay that's been used. And I'll talk about how we can affect those settings as well. Now, if we switch over to the pen tab, we have a very similar set of settings. Um, the type of stitch we've got, first of all, it's automatically being um, generated by the software. We could take control of that if we wanted to. Um, we can choose between the satin stitch and the running stitch options. And we have the ability to choose from a set of styles for the type of running stitch that we're going to get. And again, we have remove overlaps, the sequence, and things like the stitch length. So on these, you're going to find that these options below will change depending on what option you choose at the top. So for example, if I choose satin serial up top, I get a different set of um, options that I can control down below. So in general, that's how it works. And so what I'll do is just come back with a series of segments that goes and builds upon this concept that we have the ability to control the way the stitching is by using our object properties box. In this segment, we're going to continue looking at object properties and specifically the object properties for the fill of an object. And so we'll just go through and talk about the different types of stitches and then we can talk a little bit about how we can affect the way they're going to look with the styles and the patterns. So we'll start with the satin fill which is the first choice in our list here. And generally speaking, a satin fill will have needle penetrations along the outer edges, but no stitching through the middle. That's what sort of is what we consider a satin stitch. And in this case, the satin stitch really isn't meant to have styles or patterns. Those apply more to things like the step fill. Um, that said, you can certainly try applying patterns and styles to your satin fill and see what kind of effects that you can create. Um, but in general, usually a satin fill is going to have none of these. So that's why they're defaulted to not be on at the moment. Now one thing you can do um, to control a satin fill is you can apply direction lines. And if you remember, we'd shown we have the ability to add directions with this tool here. And so what I'm saying is, if you want your satin fill to be on an angle, you can choose an angle. Um, but if you don't want that angle, notice that there's a, um, I guess, a little cancel out button right in the middle. If I click on that, it'll take that dividing line away. Now, maybe you want to have the stitch start at this angle and then kind of come up to be the 90 degree angle. But then on this end, you want it to turn over and start facing this direction. So you can, with a satin fill, you can apply multiple direction lines to your shape. So that's, in general, how the satin fill works. Now, if we switch this over to be a step fill, you'll notice right away that, well, I've got a pattern turned on, so I'm just going to turn all my patterns and styles off for the moment. Okay, And you can see here that my weave fill, so different than a satin fill, the step fill will not only have stitches along the edges, but it'll also have stitches through the center. And now I'm just going to go ahead, we have the ability to add a direction, and that becomes the direction of the fill. But we only have the ability to add one. If I try and add a second line, it takes away the first one. So you can choose whether you want your weave fill to be um, a long stitch direction across your shape, or a shorter stitch direction across the shape, but it can be any stitch direction that you want. It may You may choose this based on the fabric that you're sewing on and the give or the weave of your fabric. But nevertheless, you have the ability to add one stitch direction to your weave fill. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to enlarge the size of this shape slightly so that we have a little bit more of the area of the fill with which to look at. And what I wanted to show is that for a weave fill, we have two things that we can add to our weave fill. We have styles and we have patterns and there are actually a huge list of these and it's going to be a little bit easier for us to see if I was to take this object properties toolbar and I'm just going to move it off of the desktop and make it floating. And once it's floating it gives me the ability to resize the box. And so I'm just going to maximize uh, the size of this box so that we can see um, the vastness of the amount of these choices. So I've left some of my desktop behind so that we can still see what the fill looks like. But for example, right now I'm set for a step fill and I'm on pattern number three. Well, if I change to pattern four, you can see that it changes the look of that, that fill. And if I change to five, it does again. And what's happening is 
these patterns adjust the um, offset of the stitches. And so even though I know that my stitch direction is on, I guess it looks like about this angle here. Let's see, where's the angle line? It's on this angle right here, but we're still seeing a bit of a pattern the way the thread has repeated itself. And it actually created a bit of a, a diagonal pattern here. But if I choose a different one, you see you get a different type of effect. And each time we choose a different pattern, it's going to change the uh, appearance of the fill. So one way that would be really easy to see these would be for you to create a series of pieces of um, embroidery, squares or fills, shapes, and then choose different patterns and stitch them out. But every time you do, you get a different fill pattern applied over your stitch angle. Now, under patterns, there's several that are see, sort of the standard fills. We also have other ones that give us a more decorative look like the zigzag and the fish or a weave. And then we've got all sorts of decorative ones like sea waves. And it just goes on and on. Look at the size of the list. Um, I'm going to see two rows at a time. Well, I can scroll through this list and see that there's just dozens and dozens I didn't count, but probably more than 100, maybe even 200, I'm not sure, styles that we can apply in our background. And when we do, you can see quite clearly what it's going to look like. So these are the patterns. And usually with a pattern, you're still filling in the background. But what's happening is, is the needle penetrations are being placed in very specific spots to create a design. And so, like I said, you have the ability to change these designs based upon just visually what looks best to you or what seems to be appropriate for the design that you're making. Now, the the ob the alternate or the opposite of patterns, I guess it's not the opposite, but with a pattern, we have the ability to control it in a filled in background. But if you choose a style, for example, I'll choose this little chain style. Um, you can see here that the background is filled in, but it's filled in using more of like a decorative running line. And there's all sorts of different styles. Probably if the, as many patterns as we had, we have just as many styles. And you'll see here, if we look through some of these, some of them actually create little designs. Uh, let's see if I can find something like that. There was just clicking on them is going to give you the ability to see what they are. Like this one's little stars. I noticed like little people and little animals and things that can be repeated in your background. And you might find little cars and stuff like that. Some of them are just, um, you know, little stars. And each one gives a different look. And that's our ability to choose them. So you can see here that there's um, really a massive list of things that can be repeated in the background. And so based, you need to kind of decide based upon the artwork, what seems to be appropriate to you and then you just choose either a style or a pattern and I think you can even try combining them together and making um, like two of the same so yeah like this is like little cars are being repeated in the background now I have the little cars repeated in the background but if I choose a different pattern it changes how those cars are then repeated the offset of the cars it's subtle but it's there you can see the between this one and that one so you can kind of apply them to the two together in a way and have a bit of an ability to control those. So when with the step fill, you have all of these different choices to work with your styles and your patterns. Now let's move along to another choice um, of type of stitch. And oops, I need to select the object first. Um, piping. This is a different kind of concept. And usually with piping, again, it's, there's no style applied. And I would just stick with a basic pattern. What we see is the thread contours with our shape. And so um, you don't really apply a style or a pattern. That doesn't mean you can't apply a style or a pattern. And certainly the patterns are going to give us um, that different offset from one row to the next. It changes. Um, you know, does it move 25% off the last row or 50% off the last row? And how how many rows of offsets are there? And so there's actually kind of a mathematical way of um, looking at this. But this is making it easy for us and we can just simply choose and then we see what it looks like on our screen. But you can see here that the thread is going to follow the shape, um, whatever shape that we create, and it contours around it. So that's called the piping. 
and yeah, there's um, really interesting effects that can be created using that piping option now. Um, but moving along, the next option is going to be applique, and I'll probably um, do a separate segment just for talking about applique because there are some um, things to consider. But generally speaking, if you choose applique, then what's going to happen is your design is actually going to be um, sewn with a piece of fabric as opposed to a piece of fill, and therefore we've we don't have a lot of these different choices for the applique. We don't have you know styles or patterns. It's just going to be how do you want to finish your applique, and so I will. I'll, I'll come back and have a, a, se a separate segment just to look at the differences and how we can control an applique. Uh, another type of fill is the net fill, and when you choose net fill, you can see here that what it's done is it's basically um, used an X pattern, so rows of stitches going on this angle and then on an alternate angle to create a net fill and in here you have the ability to set the size of the cell so it's one millimeter if I make it two it's gonna be larger um, you can offset the the net fill so that'll kinda offset it from the outline or you can change the angle so I've got it set on 45 if I change it up to 90 it'll change my net fill to be a 90 so that's something that can be useful especially um, when doing cross stitch we often use a net fill to fill in the holes of our cross stitch design so now those are the different types of stitches that we can apply um, there's also the cross stitch and the photo stitch types of stitches but those stitches require an image to have been converted and and we have taken a look in the opening segment um, in the quick start guide I went through cross stitch and photo stitch and what I will do is during the object properties I'll include a segment again about cross stitch and take a little bit closer look at the object properties of a cross stitch and same thing for photo stitch um, but I'll add that segment later because I need to prepare some artwork and bring that in so that we can work with it that's why those are gray now because I don't have an image um, that was converted to cross stitch and so therefore this tool just isn't available so those are the choices for fill and you have satin fill, step fill, piping, applique, and net fill as the different types of general stitches. And then once you've chosen, you have other choices like your styles and your patterns that you can control. Now there's more things that we can control and I'm going to create separate segments just so that I can look in more depth at things like the removing overlaps and the sequence and the density and the underlay and how these things are affected. So that's what I'll do now. I'll just prepare that segment and come back with that. In this segment, I'm going to talk about the remove overlaps and sequence options for your object properties. And perhaps what I can do is just put my object properties toolbar back onto my desktop just to make some space. So just to show you how to do that, I click in, on the top of my toolbar. And now you can see here that there's these um, little windows that come up, I guess little options. So where do you want to place it? If I want to put it on the right hand window, I can just click on that spot and it puts it in place. Now I can use this slider to decide how much space I'm willing to dedicate to that toolbar. And now I'm ready to go. And perhaps what I'll do is I'm just going to delete this object. And I'm going to create a couple of objects. And I'll just stick to simple shapes, like I know on ellipse. But I'm going to overlap them. Okay. So where we have now is two objects. And remember, each one is a complete circle. But the, the concept in object properties is how does it, how do you um, control the overlaps? What do you want the software to do where two pieces of fill are overlapped? And you can see right now that remove overlaps is set on auto. The choice is basically auto, never, or always. Okay. And so we'll start with that. So everything's set on auto for these two weave fills. And what I'm going to do just to show you how it works, I'll just zoom in. I'm going to pop up the slow redraw tool. And we'll just basically get it started. And it's going to sew really quickly. But you can see quite clearly that what it's done is it's created, first of all, I'm just going to stop it right there. It went around the shape and created um, what's known as net underlay or weave underlay basically we've got a bunch of stitches that are perpendicular to our fill angle but what you can see here is even though my oval is underneath this top oval the um, places where they overlap 
have been removed. And so that's because of the setting that was used automatically remove. And so if I close my slow redraw, select back on these objects, that's what I'm talking about here. Remove overlaps is auto. Now, maybe what I'll do, I'm going to select these two objects and I'm going to choose remove overlaps and I'll just make it never. Now, if I was to do the same sort of thing, go through slow redraw and then watch how this sews, we can see here that it no it is no longer removing the overlap. So, that's your ability to override remove overlaps in your design. So, I'll just stop this and and go backwards. Now, um so the other choice is always so if you want to guarantee that it's going to remove overlaps, you can set it to always. If you want the software to decide, which is generally speaking the best way to leave it, which is the default, how it comes up, leave it on auto. So it's always auto or never for removing overlaps. Now when you talk about sequence, well obviously the sequence is going to be um, what was done first and what was done second. But if you recall in a segment we looked at earlier where we talked about how the software has automatic sequence control and it basically decides the sewing sequence of your design but you do have the ability to decide okay i want this to you know move this to the start of my design or move it to the end to the end of my design and then now we've used that to override the sewing sequence of the design so now if i say start it starts with this object and because i moved this one to the end now that one's going to sew second so yeah um here we are watching our design sew at 8000 stitches per minute and don't you wish our machines could just blast it off like that but anyways it's very helpful the slow redraw is a very helpful tool in being able to see how is my design going to be stitched and so you can see clearly that um now that it's finished this uh, piece of fill now it's going to switch to doing the other one so that was by changing the sequence control in your object properties so that's the remove overlaps option and the sequence control option in the object properties and so the next segment i'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about the remainder of the object properties choices for density stitch length compensation and underlay in this segment we're going to continue looking at object properties and this time we're going to look at the density stitch length compensation and underlay choices that are applied to the objects and probably the first thing you're going to notice is that these options are actually grayed out which means I'm not able to actually just manually go in and change them this they're here um, specifically for fill stitch they're here shown to us so that we know what we can expect but they're actually controlled by the fabric settings and so just as an example, I've got this large area, um, well not a large area, but I have a piece of um, embroidery fill in step with no style and it's just a simple sort of pattern to it. And what I'm going to do is I'll just go ahead and use the slow redraw to see exactly what it looks like. So I can go ahead and quickly let it stitch. I can see it draws around the outside. It does um, like a perpendicular uh, grid or packing underlay I guess is what you could call it and then it puts the weave fill on top and so I'll just stop it right there and show this this is what I would expect I can see that the density is set at 0.4 millimeters the stitch length is set at 3 millimeters the compensation is set at 0.3 millimeters and the underlay is set at packing and like I said those things are coming from our fabric choices so if I went right now to look, I can see that we're set on embroidery normal and we're set on, sorry, not corduroy, cotton. So these are the settings that came because we were set for embroidery normal and cotton. And if you recall, um, I'll just show this again. When we looked at the, the show help for fabric settings, this is going to give us a general idea of the fact that Right now, I did embroidery normal, starting with density 40 for normal 40s weight thread. Now, as an example, we could also have embroidery normal light, which is going to still start with that same density setting, but it's going to have lighter underlay. And if you went to embroidery light, starting with a lighter density, 0.55, or, and 
it's for thicker thread. That's the concept is if you're using 30 weight thread, you want to go to embroidery light. If you go to embroidery ultra light, density is very open, 8.5, and it's for heavier, even heavier threads such as wool. Or maybe you've got um, a large embroidery thread, like 12 weight embroidery thread. So, and then embroidery heavy, starting with density 3.5, for thinner threads such as metallics. So this is what's happening. Now, if I close this, choose the fabric settings and change it from embroidery normal to let's say embroidery normal light which if you recall has similar underlay settings but has less underlay so let's just go ahead and choose um, an option from here I'll just go it just says standard normal light let's try that and then you would need to choose your fabric color well it's not the most important thing but I'll just choose a beige something similar so that it doesn't not too dark in the background and I'll say okay now right away, looking over at my design, I can see that when I went to embroidery light, that we went from packing plus underlay to netting underlay. And the underlay, or sorry, the density and the stitch length and the compensation were the same as previous. So anyway, if I use the slow redraw and start at this time, you can see here that we don't have the edge underlay, but we actually end up with what's known as um, a double grid underlay or I guess netting underlay which means it's put in two rows of this um, you know running stitch underlay before it does so perpendicular to each other and then at a 45 degree angle to the top stitching so generally speaking we were able to change the underlay type by changing the fabric type and each time you choose a different type of fabric so that was still embroidery normal well, why don't we go to embroidery um, light and choose from there uh, we'll just go with the standard light and again a lighter colored fabric say okay and now I can see that I'm going to have for my weave fill edging for the underlay and my density has been opened up now it's 0.55 stitch length still at 3 my compensation has been increased to 0.4 and these change all of these numbers change each time you choose a different type of fabric so again with the slow redraw and you'll see you just have an edge underlay and no I guess net or um, packing or grid underlay whatever you want to call it so you can see here that that's what's happening and Okay, so again, continuing on with the concept, these things, we can control them, but they come from the fabric settings, and that's why they're grayed out, and you don't just simply choose them as it's an overall thing for the whole design, what style of uh, fabric are you showing, sewing on, and then the software will generate the appropriate density stitch lengths and underlay for that type of fabric. So that's a little bit more about the object properties and all of the ones that I've talked about so far so far have been specifically related to the the tab for um the weave or sort of the fill tab. Oh, but I should show before I wrap up this segment, um it's different for the satin fill. So if I change the satin fill, then they change. So they're still grayed out, but they change the stitch length or the density well first of all there is no stitch length because if you recall when I said a satin fill there's no stitching through the middle so the stitch length is more or less determined by the shape or the size of the object but in this case we can see here that it's going to give us a single underlay so let's first of all let's make this be smaller because I don't think you would normally do a satin stitch that big so here we have the settings let's just see what that looks like so if I push start that's pretty much it. I'll stop right there. Maybe I can, can I back that up? No, I'll go back to the beginning, start it again, and stop it right there. So you can see that this is all the underlay that was provided. It walked down the middle, walked down one edge, and started to stitch. Stop. And so if we chose this, remember this was embroidery light. If we go back to sort of embroidery normal and choose either cotton or you could choose like standard normal and a lighter fabric and say OK. And so now I can see that we're going to have a zigzag underlay plus, which is probably meaning plus an edge run plus a zigzag. So let's see what it looks like. So there's the edge run, there's the zigzag, and here is the satin stitches that go on top. So we were able to change those things again just by selecting the different fabrics. So 
the choices um, are slightly different. The, the fabric choices are the same, and how they're going to affect the, these objects will relate to the type of stitch that the object is going to have, and also the size that the object is. So those are some general observations about the object properties and how they relate to the density and composition and underlay, or stitch length. And But again, all of this has been specifically to do with the fill of the object, and now we're going to come back and I'll just talk about the settings to do with the outline of our objects. We're going to continue looking at object properties and specifically to do with the outline settings in the object properties, the outline tab. And generally speaking, there's two choices. We've got satin stitch outlines and we've got running line outlines. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to go to running line outlines first. Right now, the object we have is set with a satin stitch outline and I can see that the width of that satin stitch outline was set in our tool options at two millimeters. So here I have a two millimeter satin stitch outline. And um, now what I'm going to do is change it to be a running stitch outline. So there's the running line. But um, if I look very closely, you can still see, of course, the blue um, two millimeter width that was defined in the tool options. And so that actually becomes relevant because the width of your outline, when you choose run stitch, the width of your outline will determine whether you get a single run line or a triple run line. And then you are also able to control the number of passes, but that's going to relate still to the outline. In other words, if I set it smaller and we get a single run line, and then I put the passes up to two or three, it'll go around it twice or three times. But, the, but whether it's a single run line or a triple run line de depends on what your outline setting is. So right now, with the outline setting at two millimeters, I can tell you that my outline is going to be a triple run line. And I can show that. I guess first of all, maybe what I'll do, I'm just going to get rid of the fill so we don't have to watch the fill so in the slow redraw. So I can get rid of my fill by clicking on the empty color palette in the bottom. That removes the fill from our object and just leaves the outline only. Now if I go ahead and choose slow redraw, you'll be able to watch it so, and you can see here that, and maybe if I slow it down just a little bit, that each stitch is being stitched three times. It goes forward, back, forward, forward, back, forward, forward, back, and that's known as a triple stitch, which is fine. And the reason that it's a triple stitch, if I stop right now and select my object, is based on this outline setting of two millimeters. and um, the smallest outline setting that I'm allowed to choose would be 0.1. So if I choose 0.1, now we can see, and you can see it visually that it's gone to a single line, but I'm going to watch it so. So we'll go to slow redraw. I'll push start. And now you can see that it just simply goes forward, 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 all the way around the shape and gives you a single run line. Now if you want, you can select that shape and increase the number of passes. So I'll make it two or three. I think you can go up to nine times if you want to around it. So I'm going to set it for three passes just to show how you can control this. So slow redraw, start, and here it goes around the first pass. And then when it returns to the center, it's just going to keep going a second time. And of course, I asked for three times, so it's going to go one more time around before it finishes off that embroidery object. So Generally speaking, three times around in a single ply is going to be the same as your triple stitch. The only difference is it has to walk around three full times. And with the triple stitch, it does all three in one pass around the shape. Now, if you increase your outline width, and I believe the magic number is 0.5, anything from 0.1 to 0.4 will give you a single. If I so, I'll just demonstrate that. If I put it at 0.4, still looks the same to me hit the slow redraw. Actually, maybe I'll stop for a minute and I'll put the number of passes back down to one. Okay, And hit the slow redraw, say start, and I can just speed it up a little bit. And you'll see that it goes around once and stops. So what I was saying was as soon as we go to 0.5, you can visually see that it got fatter on screen. And again, it's a single pass, but if I watch it so now, start it, here you've got that triple stitch where it's going forward, back, forward, forward, back, forward, forward, back. And it ends up doing each stitch three times. 
So that's the first thing you need to know, is that when you're dealing with a running outline, you need to look at the outline width, and it can be anything larger than, one, than 0.5, so it doesn't matter if you leave it set at one millimeter, and, and then you watch it sew, it's still just going to have a triple stitch. So the option is anything from 0.1 to 0.4 will give you a single run line. Anything from 0.5 and higher will give you a triple run line. And of course, like I was saying before, we have the ability in our object properties to control the number of passes, which means how many times will it travel around the shape. Um, you can offset this, so I guess if I wanted to, I could offset my run stitch from my shape. So we'll just use um, one millimeter as an example. And now you can see, if I look really closely, here's the shape, but I've offset my running line outside of the shape. So that's what offset's all about, the ability to set your outline further outside of your shape. I'm just going to turn that off. That's fine. Now, the other thing when you use a running line is you have these styles. And the styles are the same styles that we had in our fill stitch tab, except for this time, they apply along a line. And so you can easily see the, the way that they look. Um, that's the chain. This is more of an applique setting. And then we have all sorts of decorative ones. So, and, um, so these are all of your different choices for decorative run lines or styles for your run stitch line and I'll just click on a few of them to show you how you can you know really create many many different looks in your run stitch lines using this option so that's the running line option and um, what I'll do now is just prepare my thoughts and then come back and talk a little bit more about how um, we can control the satin stitch with the outline properties object properties. In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the object properties for an outline and this time specifically how they relate to the satin serial outline. So I'll go ahead and switch the object that has the running outline now with a special style and change it to the satin serial outline. And the first thing you're going to want to do is just control the outline width. And that's found on your tool options. And right now it's set at a one millimeter satin column. And I could go ahead and change it to two millimeters. And it gets fatter. And if I want to, I could change it to three millimeters. Or any width that of satin column that you want can be controlled. Now, um, generally speaking, when you use a satin serial, you still have that ability to offset it. So if you wanted to um, offset it by a millimeter, you have that ability. Let's just change it up to one millimeter here. Well, that's 10. Whatever, you can offset it by 10 millimeters if you want to. Um, but anyway, the idea is you have that ability to still offset it with a satin serial. Now, patterns don't generally apply to satin stitches because, like I said before, they're really not meant to be carved up. They're meant to be a stitch on the outside, a stitch on the outside. So I would suggest leaving it at none. It is possible, I guess, if you had a very wide satin outline that you might want to start applying some patterns to it um, but that's just not the traditional use anyway so um, but you do have the ability they, they they will turn on it's just I think you would need to have a pretty fat satin column before you would really start to have even be able to see them now um, I'll just skip over the remove overlaps and sequence for a moment and those are generally the same as they were for the fill stitch tab I don't believe there's any real difference I think in fact um, you'll find that they're almost exactly the same, but let's just look. The difference being with um, the fill tab to the outline tab is when we choose a satin stitch outline, we have the ability to directly override or <clears throat> influence the density, the compensation, and the underlay, as opposed to on the fill stitch tab where we actually had to um, rely on the fabric settings to make those changes with the satin outline we can control specifically the density compensation or underlay so I'll go ahead and talk about those now um, density really relates to the spacing between rows of stitches and it's it's defaulted to 0.4 because my fabric right now is set for embroidery normal but if I wanted to I could change that to be 0.41 or 0.42 or 0.45 or 5 whatever and if I hit enter 
it will change it will make that change now if I zoom in you can see here that's what we're talking about is the density is the distance between rows of stitches and you can adjust what that density is going to be you can also adjust the compensation and the compensation really relates to um, well it has to do with pull and the fact that when we stitch out an embroidery design um, the stitches traveling back and forth create tension on the thread and that combined with the give of our fabric tends to make things get a little bit smaller and so most embroidery software is going to be set up with compensation and that's what this is here so if we increase our compensation all that's really going to do is um, fatten up the the satin column to make more compensation than less and um, the last setting that we can control in here is the underlay choice and now we have direct control over the type of underlay choices we get now I'll see if I pop up this list you can see here that we can, can we could choose from tracking to single underlay to double underlay to zigzag underlay to cross underlay zigzag plus which means zigzag plus a double cross plus which is going to give you the cross plus a double netting and netting plus and we also have double zigzag and double zigzag plus and I'm just gonna leave it I guess right now it's set on cross so let's just take a look at what that looks like if we go to slow redraw and push start so the cross is giving me more or less a zigzag underlay but in, in the regular zigzag underlay the zig the stitches travel the shortest distance across the shape such same as the satin stitch column it comes on top but with this um, cross underlay the zigzags have been rotated onto a bit of an angle looks like 45 degrees and so it gives a longer zigzag effect and so that's the cross now if I wanted to I could change it let's just I guess why don't we look at zigzag and then we'll go ahead and do the slow redraw and see the difference so now we have a zigzag underlay versus that cross underlay and then of course the satin column comes on top I'll stop it and select it again and this time why don't we go to um, cross plus and see what that gives us so again slow redraw push start so here we get an edge underlay where it's going to travel around both edges and then it's going to give us the cross and when it completes the cross then it's going to go ahead and finish this satin stitch column so embroidery if you haven't guessed embroidery underlay is quite important this is what's going to give you um, a better sewing result or it's going to change your sewing results so embroidery left with very little underlay tends to be flat and may sink into your fabric um, that said maybe we're creating something that's meant to be shading and we don't want it we purposely want that stitching to sink into the layer below and therefore we might want to have as little underlay as possible um, so you have the ability to override and control your underlay so if I go to double zigzag plus then I'm gonna have um, lots of underlay here so we're gonna have the edge run and then we'll have a zigzag going at two different directions so there'll be a zigzag that's going to be the first pass of zigzag then a second pass of zigzag and then we have the satin column so all of that said when you choose an object it's the object properties is how you're able to control the settings for the outline and the weave fill and the more you learn to take control of these settings then the more you'll be able to um, influence how the overall stitching result of your design is so yeah, that's the object properties. I'm going to come back with another segment and just talk again about remove overlaps and just look at how that applies with outline objects. In this segment, I'm going to talk about object properties, specifically the remove overlaps and sequence control and how they relate to outline objects and I've already shown this with the fill objects and it's more or less the same but I did think I would show it again with the outline objects and just show any changes or nuances so um, I guess what I need to do is just maybe zoom out and then go ahead and create a second object and I'll just put it right over top of that first one and so now that it's done if I choose slow redraw you can see right away that the outline that was underneath has been um, had the overlaps removed so that it no longer um, 
sews underneath the second object. Now I'll stop this and show. So if I was to not have an, um, basically I can move this, let's say, so you can still see that the whole outline's there and let's just say we make it overlap even more. And now I have a slow redraw, same thing. It's just, it removes whatever part, the shape is still there, but it removes the stitching when it goes to s generate the stitches. Now, if I take this object here and remove its fill, so I'm left with an outline on an outline, then that works out great. However, if um, if you actually just make a change to this, you'll find that it doesn't remove the overlap. So when you have an outline over an outline, it won't by default remove those overlaps. That's part of the auto. Remember, we're set on auto for the auto remove overlap set as auto but if I wanted to say okay this oval is over top of that oval and I want this oval to remove those stitches that were underneath it I can choose the remove overlaps for always and that guarantees that it will remove the overlaps even when you're dealing with an, an outline over an outline. So, And if I don't want them to be done, then I guess I can just put it to never, and that way it will never remove those stitches. So um, that's generally how it works. And of course, um, there are times where you want to remove the overlaps, and there's times where you might not want to. So auto's fine. And then if you need to take control of it, you can come in and you can go to either always or never. So that's remove overlaps. And I guess the alternate is um, the sequence control and your ability to change the sewing sequence to the start of the design or to the end of the design. So and that is um, generally the same as it was with the fill stitch tab. So that's a little bit more about the object properties and how they relate to a satin um, stitch outline or a running stitch outline and a fill tab so those are the outline properties and that's my review of the outline properties now I am going to prepare another segment so that I can talk about the um, fill stitch tab as it relates to cross stitch and photo stitch and oh I guess this is something I haven't shown before right now I have two objects on my screen and neither of those objects have any fill and so if I try and click on the fill tab it just doesn't let me go there there's no fill turned on but if you want to go there, you simply need to add a fill. So if I wanted to add a fill, I'll, I'll fill it in in red once again. Now I can go to the fill stitch tab. So that's um, a little side note. And I guess one more thing on that topic I could throw in right now. And that is, I noticed if I use this, so for example, the outline. If I turn my outline to none, I have no outline on this object. But I do still have the outline in the artwork. Now that's slightly different than if I actually turn the outline off here on the thread palette. If I go to no outline in the thread palette, it removes the outline from the object altogether. So very subtle difference in the way that you can change your outline and fill properties. In this segment, I'm going to take a look at the object properties and how they relate to photo stitch and cross stitch. And so to do that, I need to start a new design. And I need to start with some artwork. So I'm going to choose from a file and just show that I can browse the folders of my computer. And I'll just move that over so it's, everybody sees it. Um, and I had made my own folder called Trevor's Designs. And inside of there, I've got this image that I made um, of a heart. And I'm just going to say Open. And I choose Next. And it asks me now, do I want to open it as a backdrop? Do I want to convert it to embroidery automatically? Or do I want to open it up as cross stitch or photo stitch? So I'm going to choose cross stitch and say next. And I have to choose the fabric that I want to embroider on. So I guess we'll just go with cotton and embroidery normal cotton and say next. And it shows me that there's three colors in my design. There's white, there's red, and there's black. And I can say finish. Now. Basically, um, it's done. It's already converted it into cross stitch, but I'm going to go ahead and select that image and show that now if I look at my object properties, um, the other types of stitches, satin stitch, step, piping, applique, and net fill, they've been grayed out. And now it's my opportunity to, to work on the cross stitch, or for that matter, I can actually just quickly convert it over to photo stitch. So if you want to do photo stitch or cross stitch, now you have that option in the object properties. Now, when you do cross stitch, you have a few things that you're able to control. And I guess the first thing is the number of repeats. 
and the cell size. So for example, the number of repeats right now is set at three, and that means each cross is gonna get stitched three times. You can increase that two times, or decrease that to two times, or increase that from three times to four times. That's your choice, and it'll make heavier thread based on that. Now the cell size is set at two millimeters. If I want to, I can change that cell size, um, let's say three millimeters. And it makes, therefore, the artwork's still here. It makes the cross, the, the square bigger, therefore the cross bigger. So I guess if you're having a higher number of repeats, having a larger cell size is gonna make room for that thread. If you wanna have a smaller number of repeats, then perhaps you can go to a, a more accurate or smaller cell size. The more accurate your cell size, the more crosses you get um, and the better it's going to turn out. Now, this is the background colors and you can see here, um, I prepared this design so that it would only have three colors and not, you know, 15 million shades of red to make it easy for myself. But what I can do now, and I can show the same image if you want with a, with a lot of shades, it just gets a little bit more difficult to see what you've got. But for example here, um, if I highlight over the white, it highlights all of the white in the design. If I mouse over the black, it shows what's black in the design. And if I mouse over the red, it shows what's red in the design. And you can actually use this to remove stitches. So background, if I don't want the white background, I can check that off and it takes out all the white crosses. And so if I look closely now, you can see here that I've got crosses for the black, crosses for the red, but I don't have any crosses where it's white. So they were removed, and if I don't want that done, I can just click them back on. So that's in general how it works. And if I switch it over to photo stitch, then I don't even have that um, choices for crosses. Now my controls are basically just to do with the width of the satin stitches and the satin stitch densities. So that's this, the black, and I can con make modifications to that based upon the density and the width. But outside of that, um, they're fairly automated functions, so we don't have a lot of things that we need to worry about when we do cross stitch or photo stitch. Now, I think I'd said I'd show the cross stitch with um, a design that has lots of shades. So for example, if I say File and New and start another design, and we'll go from Artwork again, and I have that same heart. Let me see, Heart 1, Heart 2. This is as a JPEG, and I didn't change the JPEG. It's going to have who knows how many shades of color. So we'll go ahead and convert this one into cross stitch and leaving everything set. And now you can see here, it's got like 45 different shades of color. Now, if I try and reduce that to be, let's say, 3, it puts all the whites and grays into one the reds all went into one and then the darks went into one and I guess it's up to you to decide well you know maybe this pink should have been in this column and maybe that gray should be over in that column or maybe it should be in this column not really quite sure anyway once I so I've reduced it to be three colors but I still have all these all of these shades are actually in the artwork I'm just saying to this software combine all these shades to be one and I can say finish so it goes ahead and does that, but you'll notice now if I click on it, then in my background, I do have all of the shades available. And so that is your ability to, for example, pick a shade out and remove that from your um, list. So I can still go ahead and remove stitches, but it becomes a little bit more accurate now because of course, because of all the shades, um, it doesn't, it, there's more choices of what I could remove or not remove from the design. So it becomes, I guess, a little bit fiddly because you're going to play a little bit with your artwork to get your shades just so, so that you can create the design how you want it. But that's, in general, this is how it works. You convert your JPEG or bitmap image into a cross stitch or photo stitch design, and then you're able to go ahead and um, influence that by these types of settings. So for cross stitch, you can control the number of repeats, the cell size, and include or not include different colors from your background. And with photo stitch, generally it's four colors and you don't get to change that too much. You can see here the colors that are choice that have been chosen, but you do have the ability to control the width and the density of the satin stitches. So that's a little bit more about creating designs for cross stitch and photo stitch and how you can um, use the object properties to enhance those designs. In this segment, I'm going to begin looking at the Wings Modular program 
And that's the other piece of software that comes as part of the Artistic Sewing Suite package. So up till now, we've focused on the creative drawing software and how we can create embroidery designs, but there's a lot of specialized editing techniques um, and tools that are available as part of the Wings modular program. And so what I'm going to do just to get started is I'm going to come over to Creative Drawings and I'm just going to choose to start a new design. And so I'll say new and just start from a sort of generic new graphic. And we can just go with the standard fabric choices that we've been using. That's fine. And so now basically what I was thinking was what if we wanted to, maybe what I'll do is create a simple shape and imagine that we want to use our Veneri cut needles. And so we'll need to use the wings modular to prepare that embroidery design. So why don't we just imagine it's going to be a star. So I'm going to come over and create my insert star shape tool and left click and drag to create a star shape. Right click to finish creating that star shape and it automatically becomes selected. Now perhaps what I'll do uh, before we send this design over to Wings Modular, um, I'll just prepare it a little bit so that it's um, been well thought out for using Veneri Cut. Now um, we can tell right now this design basically has a light blue fill and a dark blue outline and that outline is a simple run stitch. So I'm going to imagine that we want to create a star shape and we want to have that star shape be cut out so it'll be a hole in the center and rather than uh, sewing a run stitch around that hole I'm going to convert that outline to be a satin stitch so that it gives a nice finished edge to the um, the cutout shape once it's done so I'm going to go ahead and use my select tool and just click on the star and I think the first thing I'll do why not go into the tool options and take a look at the number of rays. Why don't we make this a five pointed star instead of six? So I'll just change this six to a five and hit enter. So there we have our five pointed star. Now I'm going to come and open up the object properties tab and look at the pen or the outline settings. And right now that's set as a run stitch and I'm just going to convert that to be a satin serial. And you can see right away, if I was to zoom in on that, that that has now got a satin serial border. Now, it's quite a thin satin border, and if I wanted to make that border fatter, I would again come to the tool options, and here I can see that the outline is set at 0.4 millimeters. Well, if I wanted to, I could change the width of the outline by just simply changing the number there. I'm going to go with 2 millimeters and say Enter. And so now you can see that I have a nice, solid 2 millimeter wide satin stitch border, and at the moment it's sewing around a piece of weave fill. So the idea is we're going to create, we've created a design, it's got a weave fill with a satin stitch outline and now I'm going to send it over and edit it using the wings modular and the easiest way I can do that is if I look under the um, edit, sorry, edit drop down menu, no sorry, file drop down menu, it's called export. And what I usually do is just go Control E. So we're going to export this to the editor. Control E on my keyboard, or just pull your file drop down menu to export and export to editor. So that goes ahead and basically saves this design and opens it in Wings Modular. Now, this is the Wings Modular software, and before I go ahead and just convert this to Veneri, Veneri Cut, maybe what I'll do is just give a small overview of the software. And I know I talked about this in the introduction and the quick start video, but just to review it again, um, basically, Wings Modular is um, the beginning part of a larger um, commercial piece of digitizing software called Wings and Wings Modular is sort of the base level and it basically gives us um, a number of editing techniques and, and tools. Um, so we're going to go through in this part of the DVD, I'm going to go through and highlight as many of those tools uh, um, as possible. So yeah, there's drop down menus. It's very similar to the draw wings. We've got drop down menus to access a lot of the features. Um, outside of the drop down menus there's also toolbars for some of the more common features and so what we can do is um, plan to go ahead and review all of these things but I'll just highlight some of the main ones so obviously this is your Windows new and open and save and Wings Modular is like I said it's meant for um, 
it's actually a, the big building block of a commercial embroidery program and so some of the things may not apply to all users like for example um, this option here is for writing your design to a floppy diskette and there are certain commercial embroidery machines like for example um, the Baird and FMC format which is um, a commercial embroidery machine that has a specific spe a special box that reads a floppy diskette. These are things that are really kind of a little bit from days gone by. We're not, a, not many of us even have computers with floppy diskette drives in them anymore, but there's a lot of things that are still maintained in the Wing software for those specific users. So not everything may apply to all people who have the artistic sewing suite software. Uh, so we've got print, and cut, copy, paste, undo, and redo. This is your zoom. Uh, percentage and you can change the percentage here. Um, this is some um, unselect, select all, and invert your selection. And remember, I'm going to show you how to use these different things. This is um, show and hide, to show and hide objects while you're editing. These are some, I guess, traveling tools to um, travel through your design to make certain types of edits that you may want to do and these are some of the different ways that you can sh view your design turning on your stitch marks or showing up to your cursor and showing the filled outlines there's a slow redraw tool in the wings modular that we can use and you can access your design information with this button this is the colors um, your color manager and you can see right away that our design has a blue fill and a dark blue outline and by default everything that opens up in wings modular will have the knife colors so red knife blue knife black knife and green knife and even if you don't use the venary cut in a design it always keeps those um, knife colors as part of the design by default um, these are some special commands that um, again some of them have specialized uh, uses like the sequin command but we'll take a look at the ones that apply uh, most commonly to the users of artistic sewing suite You've got a sequence manager over here on the right hand side and under that sequence manager um, I've got some things hidden like for example there's an image map that I've got. Um, you can customize the Wings modular desktop just like you could in the Wings in the creative drawings. Um, there's the little push pins to automatically hide things and so I just have my image map automatically hidden and that's why it looks like um, a little tab here and as soon as I mouse over my tab it just flies open. And same thing on the Sequence Manager tab at the bottom. There's an option for Object Properties, and there's an option for the Transform tab. Um, over on the left-hand side, you've got some editing tools, Transform, Edit Nodes, Split Stitches, Split Objects, Zoom In. Um, these are for modifying the density, modifying your satin widths, um, filtering your stitches, or smoothing out shortened stitches, and um, to reverse your sewing order so we'll take a look at these and try and find examples of why you may want to use some of these things and down at the bottom you've got a um, information bar that's going to give you some information about your design like the number of objects and the number of stitches in the design so that's a quick overview of the wings modular software and like I said over the next several series of videos I'll be going through and trying to highlight and explain how to use all of the tools and features in this program now I would said we'd make a venary cut design and so this is the design that we created in, in drawings and if you look at over here on the right at the sequence manager you can see that the first image um, the first I guess box or tray whatever you want to call these is actually an image of the whole design so that is basically showing me what the design looks like and then you kinda have it broken down into colors so here we have the light blue which is the fill object and then you have the dark blue which is the satin stitch outline and the last one here is really just the return back to center which is always put in um, so that your design comes back to your center point when it's completed so that's really all there is in this design is a fill object and an outline object and what I'm gonna do is simply select the fill object by clicking on it in the sequence manager and you'll be able to tell it's selected because it highlights it here in the workspace and now that it's highlighted, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click over top of that highlighted area and it brings up uh, like a secondary menu and under that secondary menu one of the options is change to venary cut 
And so I'm going to go ahead and select Change to Venere Cut. Now, you can see that something's changed right away on the screen. Um, although the image map still shows that it's you know light blue and dark blue, the second color has now gone to sh with a little icon here, which this icon represents the Venere Cut. And so now what we can see is that there's no fill in that object. It's it simply shows light blue as a color, but there's no stitches in there anymore. If I look really closely, it's just a color, and the only stitches are actually the outside or the border of it. And so that's, in general, what you need to do to convert something to a venere cut. And, of course, um, after the venere cut was finished sewing, so you would hoop your fabric, and it would cut out the shape of the star, and then it would complete the design with the satin border that we had created in, in the drawing software. Um, maybe to try and highlight what we'd done, I could go to the file drop-down menu and take a look at the print option. And under print, we can see here several things. Uh, I guess the first thing would be um, here at the bottom, you can see the sewing sequence. And it's it shows that the first one, two, three, four colors are actually the venere cut needles. So you would use the red needle, then you would use the blue needle, then you would, I guess they're not needles, they're knives. So it's red knife, blue knife, black knife, green knife. And then it would complete with the blue satin stitch. And that's also reflected up here in this part of your print preview where it shows, again, the sewing sequence. And there's a small icon beside them that shows that these are the knives. And then it follows up with the final color, the dark blue, as a satin stitch outline. So I'll come back to talking more about how you can customize your print preview um, options, but in general, that's the process of creating a design and sending it over to the Wings Modular and then converting it to a Venere Cut. So what I'll do now is I'll finish this video and then prepare to begin to explain all of the different features found in the Wings Modular software. In this segment, I'll take a look at open and save and all of the different formats that you can use um, with Wings Modular. So we just created this Venere cut design and obviously the next thing you would want to do with it if you were going to stitch this out is you would want to save it. And so what I would do to save that, I guess you have an option right here on the um, sort of Windows toolbar for save, which is I guess this one here, save or open and you can also just use the file drop down menu and you can choose open or save now I guess you also could use your shortcut keys control s for save and control o for open so why don't we try saving this design so I'll say control s or just simply choose the save from the file drop down menu so a window opens up and it gives you the ability to browse the different locations of your computer you can see that I am currently set to save this design to a folder called Embroidery Designs, but I could browse um, to any location in my computer that I wanted to and save it on my C drive or my desktop or whatever folder that you've got that you'd like to save your designs to. And um, so if you wanted to save the design on, onto a card to go into your embroidery machine you may have like a PC ATA card then that also could be accessed here or, or you could easily save the design to a location on your hard drive and then come and use just drag and drop um, with your Windows Explorer to save it onto an ATA card so I'll come and I'll follow up with that um, in a in another segment but basically this is where you're choosing where you want to save your embroidery design and that's what this is for and if you wanted to you could create a new folder so under my embroidery designs um, if you wanted to create a folder that was called Trevor's designs and you could go ahead and have any folder that you want to save your designs now down towards the bottom here we have the file name so basically what do you want to call it and, it, and right now it comes up untitled because I had never saved uh, the original star that we created um, in the previous segment, I had never saved it or given it a name, so basically it's just deep by default called untitled number one. But maybe I want to call it star, and I'll call it star cut. You can give it any name you want. Now, the next option you have here is save as type, and I'm just going to 
click on this triangle to open up the options and you'll see that there's quite a large list of formats that you can cha choose to save a design to. So if you want to save a design for your um, Genomi machine, then you want to choose Jeff format, but you'll see that there's commercial formats in here, um, anything like Tajima or SWF, Melco, um, but there's also all sorts of domestic programs as well. So basically this is your options for formats to save this embroidery design from Wings Modular. And so we'll just, I'll just go ahead and choose Genomi Jeff format. And then basically outside of that, you have the ability to, um, you know, put in here some sort of details. This generally would come from your uh, design information. So we don't enter that in here, but if we had, and we'll, we'll look at the design information in a later on segment, and if we populate um, the details of our design information, then those things will show up here and be saved as part of your design. But Basically, that's what you would do. So you would choose save, and I guess what I'll do maybe is I'll just save this to my desktop so that it's easy for me to find later. And so I'm going to go ahead and save the design stark dash cut dot Jeff to my desktop. Push save. And because I've chosen Genomi as my format, I get this little box. And basically, it's asking me to choose. And in this case, with Genomi, there's only one option. But if you're um, a commercial machine user there may be two or three options here that you need to choose specifically the the machine format that you use so for me it's Genomi generic and um, these are I guess your ability to control the maximum stitch length that you want to have in between objects in your design and so that's something that's a little bit specific and you don't find every day um, but the default is 12 millimeters which is sort of the maximum uh, available on a Genomi sewing machine and so we'll just leave it at that and then I'm going to say OK. So there it says I've saved the design, 3448 stitches, and I could therefore take that design from my desktop, which you can see it's up here over top of the, um, I guess I would have to, I've zoomed in. It's on my desktop, and I could um, save that design to a PT, PCATA card for use on my Genomi sewing machine, or I could email it to my friend if I wanted to and it's a very similar process to open a design so there's a you know the button right here on the on the desktop I'll say open and basically it opens up um, a window that allows you to browse the contents of your computer and so the at the beginning it tells me what folder I'm looking in the creative drawing samples that's where I'm currently looking I could navigate to any folder in my computer by using this window this box here you can also go to sort of recent places that you may have used. So by mine by default, it is my desktop and whatnot. Now it shows me in here um, designs that are in this folder, this drawing samples. And this is also um, my view menu. I could choose here the size. So right now they're large icons. If I went to medium icons, it's going to show me more designs, but a little bit smaller picture of them. And so whatever, whatever design, why don't I go ahead and click on this frog design and you'll see that the frog actually comes up down at the bottom and it tells me information about that design, like the number of stitches and the number of colors and the dimensions and the size or the number of bytes that it takes for that design. And so then th this is the name of the design that I'm choosing to open. And right now I'm only looking at files of type .ngs. These are embroidery designs that came with the software. But if I choose, again, to click on this window, you'll see that there's many different formats that could be opened. Um, again, everything from commercial formats like Tajima and SWF to all sorts of um, domestic machines, including Genomi and all sorts of other formats that you can open up. So that's the complete list. It shows there all of the different types of embroidery files that you could open. And so if I say all embroidery files down at the last choice at the bottom, then that will show me not just the NGS files, but any embroidery files that are found within the folder that I'm currently looking at. And you can see here there's a slider that allows me to um, browse down. Like if I click in, in here, it'll show me them sort of a page at a time, or I can just move down one row at a time. Anyway, once you select on the image that you like, then you would choose open. Now there are some uh, specialized things in here that again have some um, specialized uses. Uh, for example, if you had a ZSK, which is a 
commercial embroidery machine and you had designs for that, then there, I guess there's options between the new versions and the old versions. Um, then for Tajima formats, the number of cuts for a jump stitch, sort of how many jumps before you'll get a trim command. So there's some things that you can control in here. I'm not sure that they're going to specifically apply for the case of the artistic sewing suite user, uh, but that's what they're there for. And again, if you want to specifically learn about something like that, you may need to refer to the help menu, which I'll highlight in a moment. So anyways, I've got a fancy sun design highlighted, and I'm just going to go ahead and say open, and you'll see that that sun design is going to open up and become on my desktop of my Wings modular software. Now, one thing I'll highlight before I finish this segment is because I opened up a design, and you can see in my sequence manager all the different colors of this design and all the different colors that are in the color manager that are used in this design. Um, but what you're going to see now is um, if I use the window drop down menu, we can see here that I have untitled number one. So our star design is still open, and we also have this sun design, this C dw0139.ngs so the idea is you can open up multiple designs at the same time so I thought I would highlight that because I'd opened it so that's a little bit about opening and saving designs using the wings modular software in this segment I'm gonna follow up on the previous segment where we talked about opening and saving designs um, so far the progression was in the first segment I made number a 6a I created a star and brought it over to the Wings modular software and prepared it as a veneery cut design. And then in 6B we talked about saving the design and we saved the design as a Jeff file onto my desktop. And now what I'm going to do is I've just stuck a PCATA card into my computer and I want to um, show how I would simply drag and drop that design onto my card because I believe that a lot of the people who are using Artistic Sewing Suite are going to be using uh, the PCATA card as their way to insert their designs onto their machine especially if you have a Genomi machine so what I've done is um, when I stuck the PCATA card in my computer it opened up in a program called Windows Explorer and that's a default program that comes with everybody's Windows computer and here you can see the card it's my it's a removable disk and it's got a bunch of folders on it these are the EMB folders that are used um, with the embroidery machine and depending on which Genomi machine you've got um, for my MC 11,000 I need to go into the EMB folder and into the EMBF folder and you can see here that I have all sorts of designs that I've created and are in that folder and what I can also see is if I was to, so here's the folder here, removable disk, EMB, and EMBF. Now, I guess I have two options of how to do this. Um, a simple one might be for me to just to go ahead, and I'm going to come down to my, um, my Windows Manager, um, my Start Menu, and open up, you probably can't see me do this, but I'm just going to open up a second copy of Windows Explorer and I'll just resize it so it fits in our in our our viewing window that we're looking at right now in fact it doesn't even have to be all that big I can just make it smaller so what I'm gonna do I save the design to my desktop so my desktop would be found here so I'm just gonna click on my desktop and so here's the design star dash cut Jeff that's the design that I saved using the wings modular software so I have two little windows here one of them is showing the design that I want. The other one is showing the contents of the EMBF folder on my um, PCATA card. And so I'm just going to come over to this design, star.cut, click on it, and now I'm going to drag it over to the other window, and I'm going to let go of it inside of the window where my PCATA card is. And now you can see that star-cut is mixed in with all these other designs that I have on my PCATA card. So it would be as simple as that. If I now took the PCATA card and inserted that into my Genomi MC11000, this design would be available for me to sew. And I would be able to use my Venary cut needles with the MC11000. And so it's probably a very similar process for you. Um, 
If you don't want to use two windows to do it, then I guess another way to do it, it's just a little bit more fiddly, you would come to your desktop and you would find the design here on your desktop and then you would scroll here on the left and find the folder that you wanted to insert the design into and actually you can see here these folders here the EMB5, EMB6 those are because I've used this PCATA card in an MC10001 and so let's say I wanted to use this design with my MC10001 and I wanted to use it in the EMB F8 folder well then I would just take the star dot dash cut dot Jeff from here click on it left click and hold drag it over to the left and select the folder that I wanted to save it into if I said it was EMB 8 I would just let go of it over top of there and now just to confirm that if I click on the EMB F8 folder you can see that inside of this folder there's a design called star dash dot dash cut dot Jeff which was the one that we created again using the wings modular so I thought I would include that that's how I would generally approach um, sending the designs over to my Genome embroidery machines so if you have a different uh, brand of embroidery machine then generally speaking you're just gonna save the design to your desktop or to your folder in your computer and you're going to transfer it to your embroidery machine in the same method that you normally do so that's a little bit more about saving designs and specifically saving them onto an external media to use with your embroidery machine. In this segment, I'm going to continue looking at opening and saving, I guess, but this time it'll be um, specifically to do with the import and export commands. And I'll also show you another way of browsing for designs. So what I'm going to do is just show you that here um, on the Windows toolbar, we had, I guess, read from a floppy diskette and export or write to a floppy diskette. But if you look under the file drop-down menu, so yes, we have open, we have save. Well, save as, it's generally the same. When you choose save, it automatically saves the design. Um, if you've never saved it, it brings up the save or op the save dialog box. If you haven't, if you've already saved the design, Choosing Save will simply overwrite the most recent version of the design. Choosing Save As gives you the ability to change the name and or save it to a new location in your computer. Now you also have the ability to browse and this is also very similar to the open so maybe what I'll do is just choose um, to show the difference I'm going to actually start by showing open. So when you choose open it brings up an open box but here behind the open box is still my wings modular software so it basically has a specific box for browsing designs and opening them uh, but you from this box you can choose the browse option or and I'll just close this you can also choose the browse option from the file drop down menu browse now the difference is I'll choose browse what you can see right away is instead of opening up a new window to browse in it basically gave me um, a librarian program right inside of the wings modular so basically it's allowing me to browse the contents of my computer and if I click on a design and then choose right click and say open it'll open that design into my wings modular so it's a set in a sense it's essentially the same thing as choosing the open box it's just another way of browsing the designs that are in your computer now, also on that sort of file drop down menu, close. Well, we just opened a design, close is going to close it. Another way of closing a design, so this actually brought me back to the icon browser, and let's just go ahead and select this motorcycle and choose to open that. I'm just going to show you if I come to the window drop down menu, here we've got the untitled design, here we've got a design that I'd opened, CW0139, that was that sun design. It's still open. I still have the icon browser open. So it basically becomes almost like a design. I can come back to it easily. And then I have the design that we just opened, which is that motorcycle. And now I just showed you you could say you can close these windows or these designs by coming in here and saying close, but you also have the ability here not the big red X at the bottom, at the top, that's going to close Wings Modular, but the smaller X underneath it, that'll close the design you're currently looking at. So in this case, I can actually close the icon 
browser that I have open right now by just choosing close and I could even close this sun by just choosing that X right there and that leaves me with the star and now if I look in the window drop down menu the only design that's currently open is this sun or not a sun sorry it's the star I'm self confused now under the file drop down menu you have export and import and this generally has to do with again loading from a floppy diskette from a machine. When this says machine floppy diskette, what that means is, and, and again, coming from the commercial side of things, um, some of the older embroidery machines actually had floppy diskettes that weren't readable by a computer. They were a specific format to that embroidery machine, and you had to have commercial embroidery software to be able to read that embroidery format. And that's what this is talking about. So if you have a, a Bearden FMC floppy diskette and you've got a disk reader, you can actually open it up, bring it into Wings Modular, and then save it as a Genomi Jeff file if you want to. Um, you can also import from a paper tape. So talk about a throwback to my past. Um, when I first learned to digitize, we basically created our embroidery designs and then printed them on paper tapes. And so that's why I'm saying Wings Modular has all sorts of things that I, I highly doubt anybody who's got artistic sewing suite has a stash of paper tapes that they were looking to read in through their paper tape reader, but it's interesting that it's available here in the Wings Modular software. So that's what this is about, and I guess you can import plugins. I'm going to assume that that's the ability to add new features to the Wings Modular software. And you could import an image, and again, we use our, uh, as an artistic sewing suite user, we're going to bring our images into the creative drawings program. And we're going to create our embroidery designs there. We don't really have the digitizing tools in the Wings Modular software. We don't have the plugins that gives us digitizing tools. We need to do those functions over in the um, creative drawings program. That's what we're using for it. And so same similarly with export, machine floppy, diskette, um, to image, this is something interesting. So you could actually take this star design and save it to an image. And I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And the other options were to plugins and to DXF, which is a, the Wings Modular commercial format. So, But this is interesting. If you choose to image, I'm not sure the star design will really do it justice. Basically, I have to choose where. So I'm going to choose to save this just onto my desktop, make it easy for me to find it. And... I don't care what it's called, untitled.1. The formats that I could save this image as are going to be PNG, JPEG, bitmap, and TIFF. So I'll just choose JPEG, and I can choose the DPI, the, the resolution, and I can have it include the fabric which has been selected, and I'll say OK or save. Now, here's the design here on my desktop, and I'm just going to open it up and show you that it saved the design of the star and of course it would have a hole cut out of it so it's not um, showing a hole here it just shows fabric but and it even has sort of the texture of the fabric that we were using shown there maybe that's not the most attractive design um, why don't we just do it one more time I'm gonna say open and we'll select one of these fancy designs um, why don't we browse down and select something kind of interesting looking um, oh it doesn't really matter I'll select this butterfly Say OK. And so there's the butterfly on my screen. And I'll say File. And I'll say Export to Image. And I'm going to, again, save it to my desktop. And it's got the name of the design. I'm going to choose JPEG, because I know I can easily open that and save the design. So when it's done, now I'm going to open up that butterfly and show you that it actually shows um, what the butterfly looks like as an image. So that's one way that you could create an image of your design that maybe you went, needed to post it on a website or email it to your friend and it gives you that realistic preview in an image. So that was an interesting part about the export feature and so that's a little bit more about um, the export, import and browsing options in the Wings Modular software. In this segment I'm going to continue looking at the options underneath the file drop down menu in Wings Modular and this time specifically we're going to take a look at the design information and the options for printing. So why don't we open up the design information box found here under the file drop down menu. Now this is fairly interesting. There's some very specific things that are found under your design information. Um, it's telling me, first of all, it's telling me 
I have this butterfly design open right now currently and it tells me where exactly that design was found because it's been saved on my computer so this is the location or the path of the design and the name of the design it tells me the size 5.38 centimeters by 4.10 centimeters it tells me the number of stitches 6060 stitches it's got five colors okay it tells me there's no borers um, tells me the number of thread trims 13 there's no sequins in the design if I wanted to I could add a date to the design date this design with um, you know any date you want June whatever day it is 15 doesn't matter put your fabric in here felt whatever you chose these are just details that um, are going to come up if you're when you go to the print options as well as they're going to be recorded with the design so that if you um, want to search for designs in certain fat ways you could search for them by these different keywords so um, anyway you could put in the type of yarn or the average density that you were using these are your uh, sort of summaries um, so under the summary tab you can put in here the name of the customer so if you're a professional designer and you want to save you know every design you ever made for ABC embroidery company um, if you put in there ABC embroidery company then it would um, be searchable by ABC embroidery company it'll also come up on the print sheet the designer well I was the designer and I didn't make the butterfly it just came with the software but let's just put in there my name just to show that you could put your own name in there and keywords like butterfly or whatever the design may be and notes this design was made for specifically for use with leather or the colors of this design are sp special colors that we only use with black shirts versus blue shirts so you can specialize the design information and then it helps you uh, when you open the design up several years or months in the future you can have information that's helpful to you um, information about the yarn so it'll tell you you know the each the number of colors in the design and how much thread is being used um, in each color I guess is what that is going to be um, your these are some settings and I'm not even hundred percent familiar with some of the uses of them like the fabric thickness and the bobbin tension but we can obviously see what it says and um, here I thought this was interesting under stitches so it, it basically tells us um, the stitches per maximum stitch length um, but what I thought was interesting was we can actually see this on a histogram if I open this up it shows our design and it shows us sort of the stitch length in a histogram so you may be able to learn things from your design like how what the, how many of your average stitches are in this range but you've got some very small stitches and you also have some very long stitches and so that's kind of an interesting um, tool um, exact stitches and now it gives you I guess based upon the type of machine that you're using um, if there's any difference so if I said well I use a Janome machine and I have it set for a certain you know jump length it's gonna calculate the exact number of stitches so that may be slightly different from machine to machine so that's your ability to play with that I guess um, I thought this was interesting the machine time so the sewing time so if I said that I had a generic machine um, with a maximum stitch length of 8 or 12 millimeters and these are gonna be uh, the sewing speeds of the machine so not all machines have an, sort of the same sewing speeds and then it'll basically calculate so if I had a machine that sews 720 revolutions per minute with an 8 millimeter maximum stitch length it would take 9 minutes and 55 seconds to sew but if I had a machine that could sew 1200 stitches per minute um, and I recalculated it would be even less time so that's just something interesting I guess and again this has got to, something to do with sequins and we don't have any sequins in this design and I'm not even really fully familiar with using sequins so but that's the design information and we can put that all in there and then if we look under, under the file drop down menu again and we go to print now some of that information should have been sort of transformed into my print preview so basically um, depending on what information when you go to print I'm just gonna maybe move this down and make sure it's inside of my window 
you have certain items that are included and you have the ability to choose which ones so it's the header the color changes the sequence icons maybe if I move this closer I can get I don't know if I can get much zoomed in on it but the header the color changes the sequence icons the information the orientation and so you can see here that it's hiding and showing things as I turn them on the company name and this actually is print out by wings modular this came you can actually put that in it's a different place where you put in your company name by who it's made by and then that'll change in your stitch count in your printout binder space that's these little holes here that they'll go away um, stitch count so the stitch count is information the star point that's your basically your center of the design whether it's on 3d view or just regular sort of com generated computer generated lines um, including the fabric yes or no and the design date yes or no and so some of those things we were able to control in the in the design information and you can save these options as your default so if you finally you never want to have the binder space then you just turn it off and save that as your defaults and tiled prints so basically I guess if you want to have two page printing then you could change that there and auto fit so fit to your page basically making it bigger and um, tells you the number of stitches so that's a little bit more about the print preview options and the design information options that you can edit in the wings modular software